I'd like to start, first of all, by uh, dedicating this talk to the great staff of the Science Museum, especially those who have been, who have been furloughed or had their hours reduced due to the pandemic. I sincerely hope all of you will be back doing what you do so well very, very soon. And so with that, we'll get into this talk about the tides. And I'm going to try to keep it pretty simple, uh, not too complicated, and leave out mathematics and stuff like that that uh, might otherwise be uh, boring and sometimes uh, can get pretty complicated. Well, let's start with a simple question. What are tides? Well, to give you a clinical definition, tides are, a tide is a distortion in the shape of one body induced by the gravitational pull of another nearby object. That's the basic clinical scientific definition of what tides are. And that leads to the question, what causes the tides? Well, the simple short answer is gravity. Well, you've come here for more information than that, so let's delve a little bit deeper. The longer answer is tides are caused by differences in gravity. And to illustrate this, I have a very simple diagram here, which I need to explain so you can um, get the gist of what's going on here. Here we have a simple cartoonish diagram of the Earth and the Moon as seen from above. Say so if you were to go into space right above the Earth's North Pole and look back down at the Earth and Moon. Now, of course, this is not completely to scale. So in the real world, the Moon would be a quarter of a million miles to the right of the Earth. And so it wouldn't fit on the screen. So we brought the Moon in closer here. And we've also exaggerated uh, the tides so you can see what's going on. Now, the key thing to realize with the tides is, as Isaac Newton told us, every bit of matter in the universe has a gravitational pull on every other bit of matter. And the more mass you have built up of matter, the greater the gravity it has. And so the Earth has quite a bit of gravity. That's what keeps us on the surface of the Earth. The moon, being a smaller object, has lower gravity, but still strong enough that it kept the astronauts on there when they went to visit. So we have both the Earth and the moon exerting gravity on each other, pulling away at each other. And if we consider, just for a moment, the force of gravity that the moon has on the Earth, in this diagram, you can imagine that if you're on the side of the Earth closest to the moon, uh, right, uh, say, at the tip of the arrow underneath the word attraction, under average attraction there, that point on the Earth being the closest point of the Earth to the moon feels the strongest gravity from the moon. On the other hand, if you were to go to the other side of the Earth, the side of the Earth away from the moon, that point on the other side of the Earth, being farther away from the moon, would feel less gravity from the moon. And if you consider the point farthest from the moon on the Earth and the point closest to the moon, then a point in between, say the center of the Earth, there'd be an in-between gravitational pull there. So basically what we have is a difference in the strength of gravity of the moon, depending on where you are on the Earth. And so because of this, the oceans above the surface of the Earth, since they're fluid, can expand a bit, can go further out because of the gravitational pull of the moon. So we have this bulge in the oceans on the side facing the moon. But at the same time, that water is being pulled towards the moon, the Earth is also being pulled towards the moon to a lesser degree. And so the Earth on the other side is being pulled away from the water. So we have a smaller attraction on this side of the moon, but still the Earth as a whole is being pulled away from the water on the other side. So the result of this difference in gravity, depending on what side of the Earth you're on, causes the water to bulge out on two sides, the side facing the moon and the side opposite. And so we have on those two sides where the bulge is graded, high tides. In between the two high tides, there is a point where the bulge is narrowest, and that's where you have low tides. Now, not shown in, in this picture, but perhaps you can imagine that earth we have there, that blue dot, is spinning. And from this point of view, it would be rotating counterclockwise once every 24 hours. So if you take and stand in any position on this earth, say starting here, you would start off with a high tide. Got to go back. You'd start off with a high tide, and as the earth rotated six hours later, 
your point on the earth would be under the low tide. And then another six hours later, you'd be on the side away from the moon experiencing another high tide. And then another six hours later, another low tide, until 24 hours after you started, you'd be back to the, to the high tide point. So this is the basic scheme of why the tides work on the Earth, because you have the difference in gravity of the moon pulling water on one side and pulling the Earth away from the water on the other, and the Earth rotating inside the water causing the high and low tides. This is a kind of a simplified view of it. Now, our next point is going to be a little more technical, but bear with me. I'm going to try to keep the math to a minimum, if not at all. But to kind of explain how the force of gravity is different depending on your distance, um, I'm going to revert to uh, something called the inverse square law. Now, the inverse square law is a physical scientific principle that states how a force like gravity weakens with distance. But in this illustration, we're going to use the inverse square law with light because light or any electromagnetic radiation also weakens with distance by the inverse square law. So in this very simple example here, in spite of the mathematics, it is simple. Imagine we have here something called a point source. Imagine there is a light bulb there or a tiny LED, a tiny point source of light. Now that tiny point source of light radiates light out in all directions. So you could place a sphere centered on that point of light. And at every point along that sphere, you would get the same amount of light from the point source because each point on the sphere is the same distance away from the light. So for example, if we take a sphere of some size, let's just, just say for a back of hand example, let's say we have a sphere here that's several hundred feet across. And imagine we take some rays of light coming off of the point out to the surface, and we define a little box, a square of the surface there. And let's just say that this is one square foot on the surface of the sphere. So there's a certain amount of light. Remember, the light's going everywhere. So this surface doesn't get, this square here doesn't get all the light from the light source, but it gets a certain amount. And this square foot, if you take the amount of light falling on that square foot, it would be same as a square foot up here, over here, anywhere along the sphere. All right, so we have light, have a certain amount of light in this square foot. Now, let's imagine a bigger sphere, a bigger sphere twice as far away from the first one. So if we expand the sphere out or make a bigger sphere twice the radius or twice the diameter of the first one, you can see that the rays of light would reach it just as it did the first one, but would be spread out. And notice that by doubling the diameter or the radius of the sphere, we don't just double the amount, we don't just have the amount of light reaching the second sphere, we actually have one quarter as much light. We're spread across four times the surface. Same amount of light as the first sphere is now spread over four times the area. So this is the inverse square law. Now, if we were to go three times as far out, as you can see in this illustration, you're not spread out over three times the area, but nine times the area. So basically the concept here is the farther away from the source of light, as with the farther away you are from the source of gravity, the amount, the intensity of the radiation or the gravity rapidly goes down by this inverse square law. Now, what we're talking about with tides is a difference in that intensity not just the intensity at a certain distance, but a difference. So here we have an example, let's say, let's say over here at the point of our little rays, let's say right there we have a black hole, a very small intense source of gravity. Now at a certain distance from the black hole, we have a certain amount of gravity being felt by this planet here. So the planet is here, and on this side of the planet, closest to the black hole, there is an intense amount of gravity. But on the other side of the planet, which is farther from the black hole, because of the inverse square law, the amount of gravity on the other side per square foot or per square meter is reduced by, if we double the, the radius, it's reduced by a factor of four. So here we have the tidal ratio 
which in this case is a ratio of four from one side of the planet to the other. Now, if we take the very same planet and instead of having it here at this distance of one to two, move the same planet out at a distance between three and four. Here the planet is the same size, but because of that inverse square law, the difference in gravity from the closest side to the black hole to the far side, the difference is less. It's a ratio of 16 to nine. Over here, the difference was four, and over here it's a difference of 16 over nine, you know, uh, less than two. So the point of all this, all this geometry, is that if you take any body close to a source of gravity, the difference in gravity from one side to the other is greatest when that planet or object is closest to the source of gravity. The farther out you move the planet or asteroid or whatever from the source of gravity, the less difference there is between the gravity on one side to the other. So the tides are less the farther out you get. So, for example, if we move the Earth half the distance closer to the sun, we'd have much greater tides than we do now. Or if you move the Earth farther away from the sun or from the moon, uh, we would get um, lesser gravitational difference and lower tides. All right, that leads us to a question. Would the Earth have tides if it didn't have a moon? Well, if we go back to my initial example, you would have to say no, because I started out with the simplest case of the tides being caused by the moon. And indeed, the moon is the predominant source of tides on the Earth. But there's a complication. Complication number one is the sun. The Earth not only feels the gravity of the moon, but also the gravity of the sun. That's why it keeps orbiting the sun. So we have, in effect, we have two sets of tides on the Earth, one caused by the moon and one caused by the sun which this illustration here shows you uh, in two different configurations. We saw before the moon pulling up basically this bulge of water on the side closest to it and the uh, corresponding bulge on the other side. Well, because this distance here on one side of the Earth to the other compared to the closeness of the moon is pretty great difference, we get the greatest tides by the moon. But the sun being much, much farther away, the difference of the sun's gravity from one side of the Earth to the other, that difference is lower. So the tides caused by the sun are less than the tides caused by the moon. Even though the moon has far less gravity than the sun, it's much, much closer to us. So we get a greater difference because of the inverse square law. And that's what's causing these tides here. Now, the fact that the Earth goes around the Sun and the Moon goes around the Earth uh, means that we don't always have the Sun, Moon, Earth lined up in a straight line. Here in the upper illustration, we have that situation. We see what happens when there's a full Moon and a new Moon. When you have a full Moon or new Moon, the Earth and Moon and Sun are roughly lined up. Uh, if they're directly lined up, then you can have an eclipse, but it's usually not quite exactly lined up. But what I want to point out here in the upper illustration is that when the moon is lined up with the earth and the sun at new moon or full moon phases, you have both tides lined up. You have a tide from the sun, the smaller tide that's illustrated here as the blue bulge. That's the solar tide. And then the other tide of the moon, a much bigger tide on top of that. So that's why when we have a new moon or a full moon, that's when we get our greatest tides. Those are called spring tides, not because they happen in the spring, but that's just the term we use for them. So that's why when you have a storm hitting a coast from a hurricane, it can be a lot worse when there's a new moon or a full moon because the sun tides and the moon tides are lined up. Now, if we look at two other phases of the moon, the quarter moon phases, when the moon is at a 90 degree angle to the sun, then we have the two tides fighting each other. So at first quarter and third quarter moon, we have the two tides separated by 90 degrees. Those are called neap tides, and they're lower than normal. Of course, we don't always have the moon at full moon, or new moon, or first quarter, or last quarter. There are many times in between, so they kind of average out in between. All right, complication number two. 
The orbit of the moon around the Earth is not a perfect circle. It's elliptical. So every month, the moon goes once around the Earth in its orbit. There's always one point in that orbit when it's closest to the Earth and one point when it's farther away. The closest point to the Earth is called perigee. And when the moon is at perigee, and perigee can sometimes line up with the sun, sometimes perigee will not line up with the sun, but whenever it's at perigee, then we have higher tides. And that's because, again, the distance of the moon at perigee is closer than other times. So because of the inverse square law, when the new moon, or when the moon is at perigee, we have a greater difference of gravitational pull from one side of the Earth to the other. So we get higher tides then. Now, sometimes the perigee will line up with a new moon that gives you even higher tides. Sometimes perigee will be with a quarter moon and it won't be quite as bad. Another complication that comes into play, location, location, location. I've been showing you pretty simple diagrams of the Earth, Moon, and Sun, but everything is in the same plane. Well, it turns out the orbit of the Moon's plane, that orbital plane is not the same as the plane of the Earth going around the Sun. So if you take the orbital plane of the Moon, it's inclined by about five degrees to the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. So if instead of looking from the top down, as we did at the start, instead of looking from the north down, if we look from the side of the Earth at the equator, and we know the moon's plane is inclined to the plane of the orbit of the Earth around the sun, you can see that that tidal bulge is shifted in latitude. So here you can see the high tide and the low tide are at north and south latitudes. So if we just take a standard lat north latitude, say Richmond here, as it goes around as the Earth turns, it'll get a very high tide on this side. When it comes back around, the second high tide is lower because the bulge has been shifted because of the plane of the moon's orbit. So this again makes the tides more complicated. So again, from a middle latitude, you would get both a high and two high tides and two low tides, but the size of those tides could be different because the moon's orbit and its pull is tilted slightly with respect to the orbit of the Earth around the sun. And yet one other complication comes because the Earth is tilted. The axis of the Earth compared to the plane of its orbit around the sun is tilted at about 23 and a half degrees. And because of the tilt of the Earth's axis, Sometimes in the year, at the equinoxes, in the spring and the fall, we have the North Pole and South Pole forming the same angle with the sun and the moon, and so you would get a kind of standard tide with the bulge over the equator. But when you come to something like the winter solstice, um, where you would have the uh, Earth tilted away, actually the diagram here is kind of reversed, but let's just say the bottom illustration is summer solstice, Summer solstice, you have the North Pole tilted towards the sun and the South Pole tilted away. So here you can see that even with the moon close to the lineup with the sun, the bulges for the high tides are shifted in latitude. So the amount of the tides and the exact timing is going to change throughout the year based on the moon's orbit and the tilt of the Earth's axis. Now, that's kind of the technical stuff out of the way. Let's go and look at some of, the, um, some of the aspects and the effects of tides. Some of you may know that the most extreme tides on the Earth are, uh, happen up in Canada at a place called the Bay of Fundy. And I've never been there. I'd love to go sometime, and you may have heard of this place. At the Bay of Fundy, the, high, the most extreme tides there can vary from, uh, by a, an amount of 50 feet. And so here you see two pictures in the Bay of Fundy of a boat that was floating in the water at high tide and then at low tide when it drops 50 feet, it's sitting on the bottom of the bay. Now, the tides basically are caused there by the same fundamental reasons that causes tides everywhere else on the, on the earth. But because of the location of the Bay of Fundy and the, um, the geography or the geology of that bay, you get the tides uh, amplified. Now, the prime factor that amplifies it is something called seisha. Seisha is, basically, it's a natural resonance. 
And by resonance, I mean, um, if you think of yourself in an old-fashioned swing, swinging back and forth, if you're just going back and forth, you can get a certain amount of swing high and low. But if somebody gets behind you and pushes you, if they push you at the right rate, in the right resonance with your natural swing, they can make you go higher. So what we have here, the geography of uh, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, causes the Bay of Fundy to have a natural resonance that amplifies the ordinary tides at that location. And added to that, there are also a couple other things. The shape of the Bay of Fundy, if you can see it, notice that from the right, lower right to the uh, lower left to the upper right, it's sort of triangular shape. It's like a funnel. So what's happening is the natural tides going through the Bay of Fundy have a, there's a tunneling effect that amplifies the uh, extent of the tides. And also the seafloor underneath adds to that. So the tides can vary quite a bit on the earth depending on the latitude that it's at and the geography. And there's also um, an additional complication to the story based on to the fact that the earth turns uh, with the tides or the earth spins constantly once every 24 hours. And because the earth is rotating, um, it tends to drag the bulge of water from the high tide. It, as the earth rotates counterclockwise, as you see here, it tries to drag through friction on the surface, the tidal bulge with the earth. And the earth is rotating faster than the moon is going around the earth. The earth goes around once every 24 hours. The moon takes a month to go once around the earth. So because of this, the tidal bulge is always kind of leading the moon. So at high tide, you seldom see the moon directly overhead because of this dragging effect of the earth. Well, the moon is also pulling on that tide. That bulge of water is also attracted by the moon. So the tidal bulge being pulled by the moon causes the earth rotation to slow down by a very, very small amount. Every century, the Earth's rotation slows down by 0 0.0016 seconds. And that's why every now and then they got to readjust those atomic clocks, among other things. And because of another principle of science called the conservation of angular momentum, I'm not going to get into the details, but because of that, as the Earth's rotation slows down, it makes the moon slowly move farther away from us. So every year, the moon moves about three centimeters farther away because of the tides. All right, we've talked about tides so far in context of the Earth, the Sun, and the Moon, the tides you're most familiar with. But tides don't just happen to the Earth, Sun, and Moon. They happen throughout our solar system and beyond, and I'd like to talk a little bit about that now. Um, some of you with long memories may remember the fantastic Voyager space probes that made the first really good reconnaissance of the outer solar system. Among the thousands of discoveries from Voyager was one very unexpected one when they looked closely at some pictures of one of uh, Jupiter's moons called Io. And they weren't expecting this, and it was almost an accidental discovery by Linda Morabito, who was on the navigation team there. When she enhanced some of the pictures of Io, she noticed that on the edge, she could see these blue plumes. And it turns out what she was seeing were volcanoes. And of course, Jupiter is much farther away from the sun, so we didn't expect there to be a lot of heat out there. And we didn't expect the moons of Jupiter to have any internal heat that would cause volcanic eruptions. But here we saw active volcanoes going off, not just here, but many other places on Io. So this was quite a surprise. And it made scientists start thinking about what could be powering these volcanoes, because you need a heat source for volcanoes to happen. And it turns out what's going on for this moon of Jupiter is that tidal flexing is causing heat within the moon Io, which is causing eruptions on its surface. And this is because the moon Io has a pretty um, elliptical orbit, egg-shaped orbit. So at times, it's much closer to Jupiter than others. And because of this, there are very extreme tides on Io. Now, there's no ocean of water there, but the tides there affect the surface, the crust of that moon, and cause it to flex quite a bit. 
And it's that flexing that causes the heating within Io that powers the volcanoes there. Now, at this point in this talk, I normally do a, a demo with people uh, in the audience where I hand out little plastic um, cards like credit cards to do this. But I'm going to show it to you here, and you can try this on your own at home. The next time you have a credit card that's uh, expired and you're going to throw it away, or if you have, uh, oh, some gift cards that are expired, or even the old uh, card room keys for hotels, take your card and bend it. Bend it so there's a crease in the middle. It may take a bit of pressure from your fingers to bend it. Well, bend it in half, fold it in half, and then fold it back the other way in half. And if you take then and fold it back and forth very quickly, what you're doing is modeling the gravitational flexure of the surface of Io. The surface, the rocks there are kind of plastic. And if you flex them enough, high tide, low tide, high tide, low tide, do that rapidly and then feel the crease with your fingers. If you do that, you'll feel that the crease in the card gets hot. And that's because you're generating friction and generating heat just by the flexion of that card. And that's what happens with the tidal flexion on Jupiter's moon Io and also on some of the other moons out there. We know that similar things happen um, on Saturn's moon Enceladus and uh, Neptune's moon Triton. They both have eruptive features and not volcanoes like on Earth. They're not the same kind of lava, but they're generated from internal heat, just like happens here um, on Io and on the Earth. So tides are important in shaping the surfaces of these moons because the eruptions resurface the surface of those moons uh, in fairly short periods of time. Taking tides to an even greater extreme, uh, we come to a concept called the Roche Limit. Basically, the Roche limit says that if you get the moon of any planet and move it close enough to the planet, remember tides get, or the gravitational uh, difference from one side of the moon to the other is greatest the closer you get it to the source of gravity. So if you take a moon and move it close enough to a planet, the tidal difference from one side to the other will be so great that it will tear apart the moon. And the Distance is something called the Roche limit. And that Roche limit depends on the mass of the objects. But basically, if you take any moon around any planet, move it close enough to the planet, you can tear it apart by the tidal forces. And that's where we think the rings of Saturn came from. And there are also rings around the other giant planets out there too. So once you bring um, a good-sized moon within this Roche limit, it's going to naturally break apart and leave behind rings. And that's where the rings of Saturn came from. And this is not uh, a historical process because we think it's going to happen again in the future. Right now, uh, the Martian moon Phobos is slowly moving closer to Mars and feeling greater and greater tidal forces. In fact, there are cracks in the surface of Phobos seen by space probes that we think are the beginnings of tidal stress on that moon. So it's forecasted that within 20 to 75 million years, Phobos will get within the Roche limit of Mars and be torn apart by the tidal effects of the gravity of Mars. Stepping beyond the solar system, we find tides affect stars. Many, many stars in the universe come in pairs called binary stars. Most binaries are pretty far apart, but often you find two binary stars so close together that tidal forces cause their surfaces to bulge out to the point where they touch one another. These are contact binaries, and these can often change the um, evolution of the individual stars by changing the gas content, and sometimes this can lead to things like supernovas. Uh, there is also tides in effect for things like black holes. One of the ways we can discover and find black holes is because sometimes they were once a star that went around another star. So you still have one sort of normal star next to the black hole. If they're close enough, the gravity of the black hole will siphon off by tidal force gas from the other star. As that, sta as that gas goes spiraling into the black hole, it gets hotter and hotter. 
eventually gets so hot it gives off X-rays and gamma rays, and we can see those with telescopes and satellites back at the Earth. It's one of the ways you can detect a black hole. So tides are important when you're talking about black holes, too. And speaking of black holes, um, there are a lot of um, calculations that show if something falls into a black hole, the tides are so great there that it gets torn apart. If you were an astronaut and unfortunately fell into a black hole, this would be so great that the astronaut would be stretched out thousands of miles long, something, a process that's called spaghettiification. Now, of course, the astronaut would not survive that, but this is just a demonstration of how extreme the tidal force of something like a black hole is when you get close enough to it. And lastly, we can see the effects of tides on the largest objects in the universe, galaxies. These huge cities of stars, gas, and dust are usually separated quite far apart, but occasionally galaxies will pass close to each other, and when they do, they can exert tidal effects on each other. So we often see galaxies that normally look like a standard spiral pinwheel distorted into bizarre shapes like this, where these two galaxies are interacting and the tidal forces are basically redistributing the material in both galaxies. So tides go a long way from your backyard near the ocean all the way out to these giant galaxies in deep space. Well, that brings me to the end of this little journey among tides. I think uh, I've finished enough time that we have time for questions, if there are questions out there. I have a, Ken, that was great. I have a lot of questions, actually. Um, uh, so uh, I'll just go in order that they were asked. Um, one of the, I have a couple of questions that were related. Um, it was asking about, because our bodies consist of water, do the tides affect people. And then somebody else mentioned that there's a lot of folklore and pseudoscience around uh, the moon and if uh, impacting uh, our physiology. And so could you shed some light on those uh, questions? Well, that's a great question. And a lot of people talk about that. And the basic answer is that there is no real detectable effect of that. And uh, the reason for that if, um, if we think back to the start of the talk when I was talking about the tides being caused by a difference in gravity from one side of the Earth to the other, all right? So you have a fairly big distance there, all right? We have the tides, say, in the Bay of Fundy, the maximum tides in the Earth, that's 50 foot under the most extreme conditions. Well, that's caused by the Earth difference in gravity on opposite sides of the Earth. So you've got, the Earth is a pretty big planet. You know, it's you know, over 7,000 miles in diameter. Our bodies are not nowhere near that big. So the difference in gravity, remember we're talking about difference in gravity here. The difference in gravity from one side of your body to the other from the moon's pull is so minute, you couldn't even measure it. And then of course, you know, the moon is in a certain direction. So if you're facing the moon, you would have that infinitesimal difference from one side to the other. But as soon as you turn to the other direction, that the angle changes. And so, you know, people are moving around constantly with so many different directions from the sun that if there was any measurable force there, it would all even out. Uh, the reason it's so important on large scale uh, is that, you know, oceans are very big and the earth is very big. So the difference in gravity over such a large distance is significant. But when you get down to small scale, like human beings, like mammals, it's, it's so small, it's swamped, it's swamped by other measurements. It's the same reason that there are not really big noticeable tides on ocean or on lakes compared to oceans. Uh, if you go to the Great Lakes, you might be able to measure a very, very small tide, but really hardly anything compared to the oceans, because those lakes are smaller and they're confined compared to the oceans. So it's a matter of scale there. But that's a great question. Um, so another question we have is uh, how do tidal charts list different tide levels, like high tide versus low tide versus spring tide? How do they indicate that on a chart? Uh, I'm really not very practiced at using uh, tidal charts, but um, I think from what I recall seeing, normally uh, what they do is they list a time 
of high tide and a time of low tide, and then the next high tide and next low tide. And since the period between them is usually not exactly 24 hours because of all those other complications, um, sometimes you may have a day where there are only two high tides and one low tide, or only uh, two low tides and one high tide. It will just kind of vary depending on the location. And here again, the location is very important uh, because there are some places on Earth just based on the geography where the tidal effects are so small they're almost uh, unmeasurable. And that's why if you're going to um, find out when high tide is, you've got to know the location. So every tidal chart that you see is com computed for a certain location on the Earth. So if you uh, compute the high tide for Norfolk, let's say, that would not be the same high tide as San Francisco. Not only is there a time difference because of the longitude difference, but you also have a different geography, uh, a different latitude, and so forth. So all of those factors have to go into computing the tides. So uh, it's something you can't quickly do on a slide rule or back of a piece of paper, uh, you have to have a pretty good computer program. And there are a lot of computer programs out there that will do that for you. But one of the key elements that you have to have before you can predict a tide is knowing the location. You got to know uh, the um, latitude, longitude on the earth. And then you've got to know the date too, because if it's a good calculation, it's going to figure what the phase of the moon is, uh, where the earth is in its orbit. So all those factors would have to go into computing the exact amount and timing of a tide at any location. And you've got to have the exact location for it to work. I was going to say the time and tide waits for no man, just to be silly. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, got a couple of questions about um, some of the things from space. Um, one was, I was really fascinated to learn about Saturn's rings and its moons. Will uh, the Mars future, dis if Mars disintegrates, create problems? Will Mars future disintegrating moon create problems for space travel? Uh, that's a good question. Well, first of all, you notice the timeline is very far in the future. So uh, hopefully we'll still be around and traveling in space at that time. Uh, but uh, if it were to happen, uh, it would create uh, uh, a debris field, a ring around Mars. Eventually that ring would gradually decay. And what I mean by that is that the chunks of rock, the fragments of the moon, would individually start to fall to the planet. As, uh, as meteors. Basically, you would have shooting stars on Mars, and they would fall to the surface, and if they're big enough, they would, uh, they would uh, uh, disintegrate and blow up and cause a crater. And there are indeed craters on Mars, some of them caused probably by asteroids, but there is a chance that this may have happened before on Mars. Uh, there are astronomers right now that are studying the craters on Mars, looking to see if there is an alignment kind of a ring of craters around Mars that uh, might have been caused by a previous moon disintegrating. Uh, but once that disintegration starts, you start to get more and more chunks in orbit around Mars. Of course, we, could, we would be able to see that from the Earth, and so we would be able to plot that and keep track of it. So any spacecraft going to Mars, uh, presumably you would know where the material was going to be, and you would approach Mars in an orbit such that you would be either above or below safely that ring of material so you wouldn't run into it. But certainly people on the surface would have to keep their eyes out for rocks falling from the sky on Mars because uh, you wouldn't want to get hit by one of them. Sounds like a plan. Uh, what would happen uh, to human life if our moon is torn apart? Ah, that's a good question. Of course, what would happen would be, you know, once you get the material um, falling to the earth or drifting off into space, you wouldn't have the same tidal influence of the moon on the earth. So we wouldn't have these great tides that we have. You would still have tides, though, but they would be tides caused by the sun. And um, the, um, the other thing is that uh, I'm not really up on, to the, up on the history of biological evolution, but at one time I know there was uh, some discussion that the tides may have been very important for the earliest life that formed on the earth, that uh, the tidal flooding and uh, uh, high and low tides along the coast may have been an essential element in 
early life evolving on the earth. I, I've not kept up with that, so I'm not sure what the latest party line is on that. So, um, of course, we already have life on the earth, so we wouldn't uh, necessarily be concerned about that now. But certainly, if you're looking at other planets uh, elsewhere in the universe, uh, having a moon may be very important uh, in terms of the possibility of life evolving there. Just a few more questions. Uh, someone asked about, um, has anybody been able to utilize uh, tidal waves as an energy source? Well, again, that's a little out of my field, but I have read of <laughs> such things. Um, the really extreme tidal waves, uh, I didn't get into that, but when you get a sudden tidal wave, it's usually caused by an earthquake under the ocean and uh, things like those and tsunamis are kind of one-time phenomena. So you wouldn't want to count on a tidal wave per se to create an energy. But the regular tides, certainly there are people looking at creating energy with that. And I think there have been some demonstration projects where you, uh, where you invent a mechanism that you can put underwater near the shore that basically the rising and lowering of the tides uh, cause the mechanism to turn and generate energy. And that's certainly feasible. And I know there are people uh, looking at that and, and experimenting with that. I don't know of any large scale um, projects where that's actually been in, put into commercial uh, service, but it is certainly possible. And I think they've demonstrated it on a small scale. And let's see. I guess this is another one, uh, and this will be our last question for the day. Uh, what would happen if our galaxy uh, combined with another galaxy? Oh, okay, another good question. Well, as a matter of fact, our galaxy right now is on a collision course with another galaxy about the same size called the Andromeda Galaxy. Both of those two, ga the, our galaxy and the Andromeda Galaxy are moving towards each other. And we believe that at a very, very distant point in the future, uh, millions and millions of years from now, the two will collide. Now, what will happen exactly will depend on exactly the angles they approach each other. But galaxies, in spite of the pictures you see of them, are mostly empty space. So it's uh, widely believed that most galaxy collisions uh, aren't very destructive in terms of stars banging into each other. Now, you might have an occasional collision, but not a lot of that going on because there is so much empty space. It's sort of like two swarms of bees passing through each other. Now, there would be effects that I mentioned at the end there. The tidal effects would redistribute material. So the structures we see in some of the spiral galaxies anyways would become all distorted. The gas, the dust, and the stars would all kind of rearrange themselves and to a different uh, appearance, but there wouldn't be a lot of destruction in terms of individual stars or planets banging into each other. Well, that was an amazing talk, Ken. Uh, I want to thank you guys for joining us for Lunch Break Science today. I definitely want to thank our speaker, Ken Wilson. Uh, we've loved having you join us. Our talk next week, also on Wednesday, also at noon, is uh, titled From Silkworms to Sharks, How Nature Can Inspire Engineering uh, from Dr. Yadavalli from the Department of Chemical and Life Science Engineering at VCU. So we hope we can join us for that one as well. Mm -hmm.